Hi, I'm here with Trisha Hirschberger, who you might know from SourceFed or her own series like The Naked Truth. First yeah. of all, thank you so much for taking a couple minutes to stand here and be interviewed by me. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for asking me to be on your channel. This is so cool. You have such a long library list of people that you've gotten to interview. <laughs> I feel lucky to be included. So speaking of The Naked Truth, mm -hmm. I was on a panel at VidCon a couple years ago where I was talking to a couple of really amazing people and they were talking about how Gen Zers love YouTube because it's so open and it's more authentic than any content has been so far. And you have a really great literal representation of that <laughs> with The Naked Truth. So I was wondering where that idea came from. Yeah, that idea was just kind of what I needed to do at the time. It was my knee-jerk reaction to feeling like I was in this Hollywood world where everyone wanted to brand me. Yeah. Um, I actually had someone say to me, well, you can't talk about video games and wear that shirt, it's pink. Yeah. And I was like, what does that mean? They were like, well, girls that are into games don't like pink. They don't wear pink. And I was like, don't you tell me what I like. So <laughs> that was my knee-jerk reaction to, you know what? It doesn't matter what I wear. It doesn't matter how I do my makeup. It doesn't matter how I style my hair. I'm just going to be me, and that's okay. So I'm also very interested in the hosting work that you do as myself, and I think that you're absolutely amazing about it. Uh, and. I'm curious, how much of hosting do you think is talent and how much do you think is hard work? Do you think you can learn to be a good host or do you need to have it? I think you can definitely learn to be a good host. So I took a couple hosting workshops out here in LA, actually. I hadn't thought about hosting as a career trajectory. I got my degree in classical theater, so Shakespeare and Greek tragedy and all. Of, I would say musical theater because I love it, but I can't sing or dance to save my life. Oh, no. So no musical theater for me, only in the shower in the car. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I moved out here to act, um, and someone had suggested to me, you know, you should take a hosting class just to see if you like it. And they suggested a person who did a really great boot camp and then did an ongoing series. And I learned in that initial boot camp, hosting is really hard. And there's a lot of different types of hosting. And some of the best hosts out there make it look easy. Uh, and that's because they're so good at what they do. Speaking of your hosting career, I loved you and the team at SourceFed so much. It was incredible. And I was really, really sad to see it come to an end. Yeah. yeah. I saw Steve and Mike talk about it on their podcast. And oh, that's nice. Yeah, it seemed like it hit all of you guys really hard. And how hard was that transition for you? Um, it was really hard. I mean, SourceFed was a really big part of our lives. I think uh, for all of us, the beginning of SourceFed, none of us knew what it was going to be. So it was a really big gamble for all of us. We all left whatever we were doing for our day jobs or our money jobs at the time and said, you know what, I'm going to invest all of my time and energy into this thing that might be a horrible failure. We have no idea. Um, and luckily, it was not a horrible failure. It started to do well, and it built up momentum. And we were the entire creative force behind it. So we were the ones coming up with all the shows. We were the ones executing everything, coming up with the um, shoot and production schedules and release schedules and all of it. And so when the channel was shut down and it came to an end, it was, it was really sad for all of us, even those of us who didn't work there anymore at the time. It was still... It's like the end of an era. Yeah, like I got to interview Steve last year and just everyone there is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, so I also heard you mention that SourceFed had kind of a dress code for you, where they said you had to dress less femininely because people wouldn't take you seriously as a gamer. First of all, ew. Uh, second of all, I'm really happy that you can do your own thing now and be more feminine. And that's the kind of representation that we need because I tend to dress very femininely, but I also love geek content. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you for that and putting that Ooh, out there. And I would say you are a very good journalist because I don't know that I've ever actually said SourceFed said that. I have left breadcrumbs around of the time in my life when that was said to me. Um, but no, it, it was a person at SourceFed that said that oh, wow. to me um, at the time. And it, it was, you know, when things were trying, like we were just trying really hard to make something that would stick. And so with everyone's best intentions, you know, trying to say, well, people don't know you yet. They don't know that you like this stuff. So let's give it the best fighting chance by like, Maybe you should wear fake glasses. Maybe you should not wear pink. Maybe you should, you know, can you get like a piercing up here? Like oh, wow. <laughs> the things that were like, what, what are stereotypical gamer girls like? But it, it, it was also the person who said it was not super familiar with gaming culture. So it was a very fun look at like, oh, this is what the normies think. Oh, no. 
another thing about presentation you've mentioned is that you used to be a tomboy growing up, and <laughs> I really latched onto that because I was very tomboy-y, mostly because I thought that's what a geek girl had to be. It had to be one of the guys. Oh, interesting. Uh, and I was wondering if making sort of the transition from being a tomboy to being more feminine was scary to you, because I know it was one of the most horrifying things I've ever been through. Really? Um, for me, I don't know that there was like a like a moment or a decision that was the transition. I just, I think that, I don't even know that it was even like, oh, to be a geek, I need to do this. For me, it was just like, oh man, like if I go to Girl Scouts, I'm like baking and I'm not into that. But if I go to Boy Scouts, I'm learning how to build a campfire and that's cool and that's something I'm into. And then I think as I got older and kind of started finding myself and my own wants a little bit more, um, I started discovering, like, I, there was one dress that my mom was like, she hated it. She did not want me to wear it. It was like this really stretchy, long dress. It was the first long dress I ever bought, and I think it was the first dress I bought not in a kid's size. I want to say it was an adult's, like, zero or something, <laughs> but I was so excited that it was, like, my grown-up dress, and it was so comfortable. It felt like a nightgown, and I just wanted to live in it interesting to me that you said that that was a terrifying thing yeah. for you. How did that come about? Do you mind sharing? Oh yeah, I'll go ahead. Like my People who knew me only as like a littler kid would be incredibly amazed that I wore a dress yesterday yeah. because it's just it was, I was the most I rejected my femininity because okay. that's how what I thought I had to be to be huh. a geek. Yeah. And then when I have this really interesting story which is kind of weird, I was at Ren Fair and I bought a like historical dress <gasps> and fell in love with it. Oh my god. And then I just sort of was like, oh my god, I like dresses. This is terrifying. Yeah. And I remember this very wise, like, pixie cut, like, qu probably queer person was like, I was like that when I was your age. And then I discovered myself, and mm -hmm. I love dresses, and I also love being a tomboy. Yeah. And then I thought about that, and I was like, maybe I'm like that person. Right. And some days you might feel like a dress day, and some days you might yeah. feel like a t-shirt and shirt day, and that's totally cool. Yeah, it's a hoodie day, obviously. We can't all be Steve Zaragoza who wears the same thing like every day. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> he really does. All he changes I is love like, you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Steve, but you need to buy like one more shirt. No, he that is his thing. That's what he does. You go. You, you rep go. you. Yeah, it's incredible. I recently saw your Let's Play of Doki Doki Literature Club, <laughs> which is one of my favorite games. Ooh, that game! <laughs> Me and my dad actually do this podcast where we swap making each other watch or play video games and stuff like that. Did you make your dad play Doki Doki? I sure did. So it was fun. Like I made, I made him wait for me so I could sit down and see his reactions, of all that kind of stuff. How did it go? It was incredible. It was super funny. I Isn't love it? what they did with that game. I love how meta they made it um, and just kind of turned that whole genre on its head and make you think about it a little bit more than most people do. It was yeah, very cool. Yeah, it was super fun. By the way, the podcast called Validate Me. Wink. Go watch it, please. <laughs> Send us emails, please. We're desperate. <laughs> so sort of to wrap this up, do you have any advice for people who want to turn their passions, geeky or not, into careers? Yes. Which is the panel you just did. Yes, hey. that is the panel that I just did. Um, my biggest, my, the biggest thing I wish to impart is don't let perfectionism hold you back. Put content out there, even if it's not the content you always dreamed you'd make because it's not the right time in your life, or you don't have all the resources, or you wish you had a better camera, or whatever. Those things will always be there trying to hold you back, and you kind of need to tell them to calm down and just put it out anyway. And everything you do gets a little bit better. I mean, any of the big YouTubers that you guys watch, go back and look at their very first video. It is nothing like the videos they make yeah. now because we all start somewhere. A lot of YouTubers' first videos are private, so you can't even see them. Oh, funny. They're real bad. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, don't privatize them. Put them don't. out there for everybody. The other thing I will say is when you do get to a point where you're starting to see some uh, income come in from the work that you're putting in, because it starts very small. Um, how many of us have, I think I tweeted out a one cent YouTube check yep. once. Um, it happens. Uh, when it starts very small, the best thing I can say then is to try to diversify. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking, I want to be a YouTuber, I want to make my money full-time off YouTube, and you're just relying on AdSense, that's going to take a lot longer than, say, if you said something really funny once in a vlog, and you get it printed on a mug, and you also sell those mugs. Hey. Or you also have a Twitch channel that has donations come in every now and then. Or you have a Patreon for your really diehard folks. Or you do live shows sometimes and you do them at venues that charge ticket prices and share those ticket prices with you or whatever it is. 
however you diversify, um, diversify, diversify, diversify. And then if you're making just a little bit, but you're making just a little bit from a bunch of things, that can equal your full-time living. Also, we are here at Los Angeles Co Comic-Con, surrounded by fans of all things geeky. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what is one piece of media that you would recommend to everybody watching, whether it was something you enjoyed as a kid or something you enjoy a lot now? Of any media? Any media. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat and give you two answers. Okay. Um, so for movie, I'm going to say The NeverEnding Story. Yes. Because I, so you've seen it? Yes, it's so good. Good, that makes me so happy. I think that it has a lot of really important life lessons in it and a lot of fantasy and a lot of important believe in yourself and I love an underdog protagonist. Uh, and then I would say for games, have you ever played the game Mist? I have definitely heard of it and I bet my dad right now is, yep, he is really He's wanting nodding. me to play it. Uh, I would say give give Mist a try and go into it no walkthrough, no prior knowledge, don't know anything about it, just drop in and see what your experience yeah. is. One of the first games I played was Zork, so he's certainly really into making me play Shut classics. Shut up, really? Yep. Ah! <laughs> Zork might have been my first game ever. Really? It was yeah. one of the first games ever. Zork is amazing. Zork is so fun. But thank you again so much for taking a couple minutes to sit down with me. It really means a lot to me to be able to talk to someone who's been through a lot of the same stuff that I have and yeah. another host and just sort of talk. About that kind of You're amazing. Congrats on your channel. Thank you so much for having me be a part of it. I'm honored. Thank, Thank you. you.